Let us pray. We are grateful, loving God, for your presence with us today, particularly on this Sunday. This Sunday of the celebration of palms, of a recognition that it's Jesus who came from Capernaum, who gathered his disciples from around Palestine, comes into this centre of religiosity, the place of Jerusalem where he will be crucified. May we move toward that with a sense of solemnity, but also with a recognition that new life will emerge from this time of reflection and death. For this we give you thanks. Amen. Now you must be getting a bit tired of me mentioning my trip to uh, Jerusalem, which happened about, uh, I suppose, about 11 or 12 years ago. But I mention it so often because it was so significant. Um, I'd been a minister for many years and I hadn't been to Jerusalem before. And so I had the chance not only to visit Jerusalem, but also to, to be in uh, Israel and to spend time in Capernaum and other places as such. Jerusalem is a remarkable place today as it was in the time of Jesus. I may have mentioned once before that there's a psychological condition associated with some people who visit Jerusalem. It's called the Jerusalem Syndrome. It can affect people psychologically who are normally psychologically healthy when they visit this central religious place. Jerusalem is overlaid historically, theologically, ideologically, religiously with so many different layers. It seems to be related, this syndrome, to the encounter with a place that has an overabundance of religious significance. And it's quite interesting that this syndrome, this psychological feeling that people have, is not related just to Christianity, but also to those who are Jewish who visit, who are Muslim who visit, and who are Christians who visit. Why does it happen? Psychologists have looked at it for years and haven't really been able to work out, other than it is an overcoming of something deep within that has been so much woven into the very life of all of us. I suspect that certainly within this community, just the word Jerusalem will already conjure up ideas and thoughts within your own mind of a place. They may be accurate, they may not be, they may be biblical, they may be 20th, 20th century. There'll be many aspects to it. Of course, it's a city that existed 200 years before the birth of Jesus, associated most with King David, who was the one who actually brought Jerusalem into the role of being a city, who actually conquered the Jebusites, the uh, poor people who were already there and were a part of the country. But it became for those who were the followers of Moses, of Abraham, of, of all of those saints, became the, the, the place where they discovered they had a home and they belonged. That itself, of course, we know has caused problems throughout the generations in terms of life itself. But it can be a place that can overwhelm you. Now, as I said, I, I spent um, quite a few weeks in Jerusalem and then quite a few weeks in, uh, in Capernaum and in the northern part around Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his ministry. Can I say it again? Jesus was not a, a city boy. He was from the country and his ministry was done mostly within the country. 
And it's now that we need to find Jesus in this central religious place of Jerusalem, where he will be tried, he will be executed, and he will, his followers will experience this sense of new life, that he is not necessarily gone, but still present with us. I suppose that obsession with Jerusalem is something to do with the stories, with the myths, with the mysteries, with the messiahs, with the symbols, all associated with this place that can overwhelm each one of us. When was the first time you heard about Jerusalem? Maybe you were three, four, five years of age, perhaps a teenager, whatever it was, it was probably quite a long time ago because we've all had that part of that city ground into our being, into who we are as human beings and particularly as religious people, as followers of Jesus. As I said, we often associate Jesus with Jerusalem, but he's really associated, of course, with Galilee, with that whole area there. And Jerusalem now becomes the central focus just for a very short time in which we will find the life of Jesus being taken from him. By whom? By the religious authorities, by the political authorities as such. The interesting thing about visiting Jerusalem today is that there isn't a lot of difference between what it looks like, the old city that is. Of course, Jerusalem is much bigger than just the old city. The old city is around about a kilometre by a kilometre, so it's relatively small, completely walled all the way around. The walls do not go back to Jesus' time. They have been pulled down, rebuilt, pulled down, rebuilt, pulled down, rebuilt which is what happens with any city in that way. But they still remain with the very essence of what it is to be in a sacred place. I had the opportunity to actually see what we would call Golgotha. Now, it may not be as one would imagine if you have a religious site, what's the first thing you do with it? Anybody have an idea what you do with a religious site? Have a guess. You build a church on it. That's the first thing you do, is you build a church on a religious site. So it's quite interesting that Golgotha, Calvary, the place of Jesus' death, which archaeologists have a pretty good idea of where it is from working out from the site where the walls were and so forth. It's in the basement of a church, just a bit of a mound of dirt in the basement of a church, a garbage dump, which is what it was. We know that most of the garbage has been taken away now, probably as souvenirs uh, to be displayed in some other place. But it was in the very basement of a church and down we went, down we went into this place and stood there and just reflected upon it for some time. At one level, it, it, it doesn't matter where Jesus was crucified, but there is something symbolic about being in a place where you know something so significant has actually happened 2,000 years earlier. And there we stood and, and looked at this particular place and I think the priest who was leading us offered a prayer. But what I wanted to really say was that the city itself hasn't changed a lot. Probably the stuff they sell might be a bit different today. It's all made in Asia or somewhere rather than uh, in the Middle East. But it's pretty well the same thing. It's a trader's place. Now, not only is it a trader's place where you buy and sell, which we might think is a bit tacky when we're walking down because we're expecting something holier than that. 
Nevertheless, it is and has always been a crossroad, not just a crossroad for trade, which it was, but a crossroad for ideas, for religious ideas and so forth. And so Israel and Jerusalem particularly, of course, has been a place where people have, have come together talk, speaking different languages uh, and trading with one another and trading ideas with one another. So it became a very significant place. The other interesting thing about it is that we have an idea of what a procession should look like. Well, I know what a procession should look like. It should look like what's going to happen this afternoon in Swanston Street. It should be a few thousand people marching down the centre of a large street, carrying whatever it is, banners or notes or, or whatever, and finding their way down and then having speeches at the end of the, of the uh, gathering. But if you walk through the streets of Jerusalem, you can reach out on one hand and touch one wall, and you can reach out on the other hand and touch the other wall. That's what ancient cities were. And if you're lucky, someone won't throw a bucket of something on your head because that's also what ancient cities were. So when you imagine, just for a moment, this procession, procession of palms, of, of, of coats being thrown, as, as uh, Matthew's Gospel mentions, um, of people pulling branches off the trees. It, does, it doesn't in each of the Gospels say they were palms. It's just assumed that they were palms because they were in that part of the world. They were pulling branches on. But it was a common thing to place red carpet. Uh, we didn't have any red carpet, so what do you do? Take off your garment or put down branches so that it would give the idea that this person who is coming is, is an important person and a significant person. But it was all happening within a very closed environment and a very small environment. Procession, yes it was, but it was of a person who was coming into a city on a donkey, not on a war horse, and coming with a group of disciples, and there would have been more of a quizzical nature about what was happening. What's the noise happening up the street? Oh, I don't know, something's going on up there. Oh, Oh, I heard that there's someone coming to town who's supposed to be fairly famous or whatever. Oh, really? Not the same person as last week. He was a bit of a disaster. And it would have been that kind of conversation that would have happened within the environment. Because remember, Jesus is coming into this environment as the hidden one. He's coming bringing something that is not a part of the culture of that time. Jerusalem is under the power of the Romans and the Romans know how to do processions. They know how to make something seem particularly important. But not this. This was unimportant in one sense. And yet, perhaps the most important thing that had ever happened before in the world. We read before from the, from the Gospel the story about David, King David. And I mentioned that King David was really the founder of Jerusalem, the one who brought Jerusalem into the realm of being a city, and a significant city too. And of course, his legacy went on and on through Solomon and many of the others, other leaders of the time, even to the point where Matthew wants to link Jesus with David because he was such a significant person within the culture at that time and probably continues even uh, till today. I mentioned to the nine o'clock, if you go to stay in Jerusalem and you want to stay at the best hotel, which one do you stay at? Who knows? K 
King David Hotel, best hotel in Jerusalem. That's where you stay. That's where all of the dignitaries from around the world stay. It remains a significant and fundamental part of the very nature of what it means to be Jewish around that idea. But I want us to look, just as we spend just the last few minutes on this, and that is to look at this story in three different ways. Now, this might be difficult because I was trying to write it out and I found it very difficult. First of all, there's a sense in which this story has a past, and that is the reference to it is the reference to King David. It's the reference to David being the, the one who will bring freedom to Jerusalem. By the time the Psalms were written, Jerusalem was really a vassal. That is, it was under the control of the Romans. And that this king, or at least the representative of this king, David, would be the one who would bring peace. How do you bring peace to a city? You bring it through violence. You bring it through war. And there were at this time, of course, the zealots who were there and wanted to make sure that they showed the Romans who was boss and that the boss was the king of Israel. And so the story itself reflects upon the notion that a person in the same image as David is going to take control and is going to bring back Jerusalem into its rightful place. And that's the first aspect, and that comes through from the Psalms, when we read, when we read the Psalms. And so Hosanna, Hosanna, he comes in the name of the Lord. But then there's another aspect to the story, because he doesn't come as a conquering hero, or does he? Well, he certainly doesn't come as a hero who has troops and is violent. If the Romans were going to do this, they'd have, I don't know, three or four hundred troops marching forward in front of the commander-in-chief and a few hundred behind. I don't, know, I don't know enough about my Roman history to know how they would do it, but they would do it with pomp and ceremony. Here we've got another kind of pomp and ceremony, and that is that Jesus comes on a donkey. Now, donkeys weren't quite as devalued as they are today. They were still something that you would use within a procession. And so we don't need to see the fact that Jesus came on a donkey as, as necessarily um, a weak thing. But it would have come as a small group of people who would have wanted to see something happen. Some would have thought, well, I don't know how this is going to happen, but there is going to be some kind of revolution and there will be a change of government. And one party will be out and another one was in. Well, you didn't really have parties back in that day. You had empires. So one empire will be out and another empire will be in. And that was the desire of obviously from a very large group of people. Do you really want to live under a foreign emperor all the time? Of course not. People want a sense of freedom to be able to do what they want to do. And yet, here comes a message that they had not heard before. And that is there is going to be a transformation. There's going to be a change Things are going to be different. And that is, there is going to be a revolution. But it's going to be a revolution of the heart. And that is, Jesus is going to bring a new ideology, a new message, a new way of being in the world. And that way is going to be completely reversed it's actually going to be from the inside out 
rather than from the outside in. Most often we change each other from the outside in. I'm going to make you do this and you'll do it. Well, that doesn't quite work at Turak Uniting Church, but anyway, in politics it does. I'm going to make you do it and you will change and you will do it. This other notion, which is almost impossible to believe and to understand, is that there is an internal transformation that it will happen from the inside out. It will be based upon, as we know, and it's mentioned over and over in the Gospels, it's based upon love. Now, we must be careful that we don't sentimentalise this. Because remember, in 2,000 years, we still look around our world and we see some of the most awful violence and war that we've ever seen. We've seen genocide over and over again. The only way I think that we can understand this is in two particular aspects. First of all, to do with time. We have no control over time. For us, 2,000 years is a long time. But maybe 10,000 years or 100,000 years is something that's going to take for this to take root within the very being of humanity. And that is that love can conquer all. Poets write about it, philosophers write about it, theologians write about it. We wish for it, we pray for it. It doesn't quite seem to happen, but that doesn't mean to say that people of faith can't still recognise that it can happen. That's because we worship the God of the impossible. And the impossible, of course, is that we can have peace within our time. Pray God we can. Or that we can have peace within our world. And that's what keeps our faith alive. Our faith alive is not by looking around and seeing the good things that happen. I have no problem looking around and seeing the good things that are happening. That's an important part of being a healthy human being. But there also needs to be a much deeper level, a much richer level, and that is to look around and see the things that aren't happening. And that's what faith is about. Faith is that belief in the God of the impossible. I can't see how that could happen. It's totally impossible to my imagination. I cannot see how the world could live within a world of love and hope and peace and so forth. Well, now you're in the right place because now you're in the place of God. You're in the place of faith. You live into it. You live into the sense of impossibility, of recognising that it is beyond me to be able to make the changes. Do I participate in them? Do I acknowledge them? Of course I do. That's what it means to be, as I mentioned before, a healthy human being, to be willing to hold that these truths will come to be. Do I have the power to bring them about? No, I don't. I can participate, but I cannot necessarily do them. One of the theologians that I particularly like reading often talks about God doesn't so much exist. He's trying to, like all philosophers, play around with words. He said God doesn't Exist. That is, God's not an object out there that exists. God doesn't so much exist. God insists. God insists. That is, 
God comes to us as a presence that keeps working over and over within us. And so, to finish, Jesus rides this donkey into the city. It's a story probably embellished by the various gospel writers, not mentioned by Paul as such, but something that gives a sense of hope that the world will change, that the world of the people will change. And it's written, of course, not only for the people of the day, it's written for us today, that we may see that the world can change, that the God of the impossible can do the possible, can bring about a whole new way for us to understand and live within the world. March for peace, work for peace, hope for peace, live for peace, be peaceful. Oh, oh I think that was actually meant for me. Uh, but anyway, we'll add it to everybody. Live for peace. And that is then entering into the very nature and the principle of God. And that is, even though it's impossible to see at the moment, and I can't see it, I can't see the world. If I watch television on, on, at 7 o'clock on, on, uh, during the week, now you know that I watch the ABC. I can't see it. And the journalists certainly can't see it because all they want to do is show me more and more pictures of war. Very seldom do I see a picture on my television set that has to do with peace or a new way of thinking. You get it occasionally. But when I live into it, it does something to me. It changes me. It gives me maybe a sense of hope. It helps me with one of the pieces that the choir sang right at the very beginning earlier about going through the valley of darkness and yet still being able to hold life, live life, know that life is of value and worthwhile. So many things that this simple story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem can remind us. Maundy Thursday, we will continue here and gather. Good Friday, we will gather again to remember the death, the crucifixion of Jesus. Easter Sunday, daylight changing time, don't forget that. We will also come. Why will we come? Not to say that suffering is all over. Not to say that, oh, it's finished, it's all done, life is now beautiful and wonderful. It's not. We know that. What it says is that there is hope and that the God of the impossible is a God who I follow and I'm willing to place my life and energy into that kind of God. Amen.